Good afternoon. We are on Tuesday, the 29th of November 2022. It's 3.47 p.m. and over 40 minutes ago now, I think, I began the recording this book, Chapter One, but I hadn't got that far and my screen cut out. So I assumed, and it probably was right, that I have too many videos on my hard drive. So I've taken this time to move lots of folders with recorded videos onto my Seagate. I have many, I have a few exterior hard drives. So I thought it must be that. So we'll find out now when I turn this. Oh, it is on. It hasn't gone off. So if it goes off after a few moments, I'll know there's something else. And I'm not very technical, so I will begin with one or two prayers, which I was doing, and um, about to begin chapter one of this book, when it all went off the screen. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Prayer to my guardian angel. O angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light, to guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Prayer to Saint Michael the Archangel. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend me in the day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray. And do you, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl through the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. I've explained what this book is about in an introduction. It's already up there for some time, this afternoon I mean. And it traces the role of Judaism and the Jewish people in God's plan for the salvation of mankind from Abraham through the second coming as revealed by the Catholic faith and by a thoughtful examination of history. This book will give both Jews and Christians a deeper understanding of Judaism, both as a religion in itself and as a central component of salvation history. This book examines the unique and central role Judaism plays in the destiny of the world. It's documents that throughout history attacks on Jews and Judaism have been rooted not in Christianity but in the most anti-Christian of forces. The areas addressed in depth include the messianic prophecies in Jewish scripture, the very anti-Christian roots of Nazi anti-Semitism, the links between Nazism and Arab anti-Semitism, the theological insights of well-known Jewish converts, including the author, and the role of the Jews in the Second Coming. Perplexed by controversies new and old about the destiny of the Jewish people, you can read this book by a Jew who became a Catholic for a well-written, provocative, groundbreaking account. Some of the answers must have never been heard before and must reading for Jews and Gentiles, tracing the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, it gives the reader a better understanding of the scriptures from the beginnings of the Jewish people and examines the historicity of the prophecies about the coming of the Messiah in the Old Testament and in the Talmud. And Schumann weaves together fascinating speculations on the ongoing role of the Jews in the light of the Holocaust, the state of Israel, Islam and the second coming. This is an important book for the insights it provides and for the discussions it should provoke. So we're now going to begin with chapter one. The introductions and acknowledgements are in another video, the only one that's there at the moment. And I was reading this when my computer cut out the footnotes at the bottom. 
technically the precise meaning of the term Jew raises some complex issues. In this book, unless otherwise noted, the term will be used in its general sense, i.e., for example, Jew, original, one of the tribe of Judah. Hence, any person of the Hebrew people, which incidentally I discovered only this year from Monty Brenda, that my mother and her mother were Jewish. They never told me at all. I never knew, and neither did my brothers. But my brothers, the ones that are still alive, they look very Jewish, especially the one under me. He's got this beard. <laughs> he really does. Anyone whose religion is Judaism... Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary. So this is for all of us, Jews and non-Jews, Christians and non-Christians and Islam, Muslims. Everyone should be fascinated with this. It's history. And the second coming of Christ will come for all believers in God and it will come for the non-believers and they better start believing because God must be losing patience. He, he knows that his word has been spread throughout the whole world, now through the internet, not just churches, but they all know the Ten Commandments by now. They must know that God is a real, real God. He's really, really alive, and he'll show his power through his son, Jesus Christ, one day. You'd better be ready. Because if not, where will you be in eternity? Where? I'd like to meet you in eternity. Chapter 1. The Jews and the coming of the Messiah. Since the purpose of this investigation is to explore the real meaning of Judaism, that is, the role of the Jews, and Judaism in the salvation of mankind, God's first and chosen people. The first step is to examine the meaning of Judaism prior to the coming of the Messiah. God's ultimate revelation of himself to man was in the coming of Jesus Christ, that is, in God himself, taking on because he's totally spirit, human flesh, and revealing himself to man in his own person, and then providing a continuing revelation of himself through the Holy Spirit, guidance and protection of the teaching office of the Catholic Church, despite its faults and failings, the Catholic Church cannot change the word of God and what God has ordained. It does lots of things that are not right with God, but he'll punish them who've done it. Yet prior to the incarnation, that's of Jesus Christ, it was Judaism that represented the fullness of God's self-revelation to man. And the faith of the Jews was fullest possible expression of man's allegiance and loyalty to God. Perhaps the easiest way to start is to consider the situation from God's point of view. What preparations would have to be made to make the world ready for the incarnation since he would be born to a particular woman who was a member of a particular people? This people would have to already know enough of God and his ways 
to be able to make sense of the incarnation. In order to make sense of the incarnation, they would have had to be prepared for it beforehand through prophecy so that they would be able to recognize, acknowledge and understand it it at least to some extent when it happened. Thus they already would have had to have learned a good deal of the theology of how God works, of the relation between God and man, of the state of the soul, of the fall of man, of the meaning of life on earth, and of eternal life, and so forth, in order to understand the incarnation and its meaning at all, they would have to have been purified from the influence of false gods, from false or demonic religions, from idols, which I'm often accused in here of having idols, they're not there to remind me of the saints and the holy people who've gone before. And I ask through the power of the Holy Spirit for them to pray for me and for you. The power of the Holy Spirit is who we pray for through. From false or demonic religions, from idols, from practices that linked them to the influence of the fallen angels, those who fell with Lucifer, and became satanic, demonic creatures in order not to hopelessly pollute the revelation there would have to be a family Jesus had to be born into a family and more specifically a mother to whom the God-man would be born she would have to be of sufficient purity and virtue not to make the incarnation itself a sacrilege. She had to be the purest of purest of creatures. Since God relies on man's prayer, yours and mine, to bring about his plans, this people would have had to have been taught for generations to pray and beseech God to send the Messiah. I often wondered until this year why I prayed so much. No joke, when I lived with Donovan in Jamaica, I prayed for hours and hours a day, hours, and even before I went there. But that's in my system, isn't it? My spiritual family, ancestors. For generations to pray and beseech God to send the Messiah. Finally, they would have to provide a society and an infrastructure that could serve as a platform from which the news of the incarnation, the propagation of the religion established by the God-man could go out to all the world. The entire history of the Jews shows how they were chosen and groomed to fulfill these roles. And now, what did, this isn't in the book, this is not in the book, and now we've reached a point in time when the whole world knows about Jesus Christ. There is no one on this earth heathen, pagan, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, who whatever, who doesn't know about Jesus Christ. They all know, all of you know about him, whether you worship him or not, or accept him or not, you know about him. And that is a danger for you if you don't love him. This is not in the book. 
that's a danger for you if you if you know about him you know what he stands for you know what he taught you know his commands were the commandments of god and you don't obey them and you don't care and you don't care about god and you don't love god then you're in mortal danger for eternity that's not in the book that's me janet telling you so i hope you respect and realize you need to hear more of the contents of this book because if the end times are upon us and come soon or however soon is soon you won't be ready you'll be a lost lost soul for eternity so please listen and learn as I'm listening and learning as I'm reading because it's waking me up in a way that and I've only read to page 16 this man is gifted who has written this book I'm telling you please go along with me it's important what he's saying the beginnings of the Jewish people the history of the Jews began with Abraham God chose him to leave his people go to a distant land and found a new and great people God's call of Abraham at the time still named Abram came in Genesis 12 1 to 3 now the Lord said to Abraham Abram my apologies go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who curses you I will curse and by you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Note that already here there is a foreshadowing of the role that the Jewish people were to play. For it was through the Messiah that all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's you and mine. Much of the story of Abraham in Genesis points up his noble character and virtues, including, pardon me, his boundless trust in God, his generosity, his loyalty, his reverence and worship, and fidelity to God. The ultimate test of Abraham the incident which epitomizes his loyalty to and faith in God occurs in Genesis 22 verses 1 to 18. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I, he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering, upon one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder. 
and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Then Abraham put forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time, from heaven and said by myself I have sworn says the Lord because you have done this and have not withheld your son your only son I will indeed bless you and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because you have obeyed my voice. This story illustrates the quality for which Abraham was chosen to start the Jewish race, his total dedication to God. This quality was also to be the central characteristic of the entire race, the quality that would enable it to undertake all that was necessary to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. Abraham had to wait until he was over 90 before having his first child with his wife Sarah, a child through whom God had promised to make him a great nation. Yet, without a moment's hesitation or a single question, Abraham was willing to sacrifice him to God. The scripture makes it clear that it was Abraham's behaviour during this test that would earn for him and hence for the Jewish race the honour of bringing forth the Messiah. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. 
Genesis 22:18. This same passage illustrates very powerfully another aspect of the relationship between the Jews and the coming of Christ. Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac was intimately linked to, one could even say reciprocated by God's willingness 2,000 years later to sacrifice his only begotten son on the very same mountain just a few hundred yards away at the spot known as Calvary. The very circumstances of Abraham's act foreshadowed, reflected in advance the ultimate fulfilment 2,000 years later. Take your son, your only son whom you love. Genesis 22, 2 was echoed 2,000 years later in For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his beloved son. John 3.16, Matthew 3.17 As the son of Abraham climbed the mount with the wood on his shoulders for his own execution, so too did the son of Abraham. Of God. So we see that Abraham's utterance, God Himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, Genesis 22 8, was prophetic far beyond anything he knew, referring not only to the provision of the ram provided by the Lord but also referring far more profoundly to the only truly acceptable sacrifice, that of God's Son himself on the altar of Calvary. The next heading, Roles Played by the Jewish People. In this, we see three of the roles that the Jewish people were called upon to play in salvation history. First, to give themselves completely to God, resulting in a uniquely intimate covenant between them and God. Second, by their loyalty and virtue, to bring blessing and eventually the ultimate blessing of the Redeemer to all of mankind, and third, to foreshadow prophetically later salvation history in their own history. Yet, this does not exhaust the role that the Jews were to play. The Jews were also to host the incarnation itself, to be the people among whom God would become man. If God was to be on a uniquely intimate basis with the Jews and eventually to incarnate among them, they would have to be free from all Involvement with other deities, free from all spiritual pollution, hence the severity of the restrictions in the Old Testament against any form of idolatry or sorcery, both of which establish ties between the practitioners and fallen spirits demonic spirits. This purity and the development of virtue and piety 
among at least some of the Jews, would have to reach its ultimate fruition later in producing an individual of such devotion and virtue that she could give her flesh to be the flesh of the God-man, that she could be his human mother. This individual was, of course, the Blessed Virgin Mary. If redemption through the Messiah, when he came, would require a high level of moral behaviour, then mankind would have to be prepared for this higher moral standard too. Judaism performed this function when it introduced God's morality to man through the revelation of the Torah. I'm just looking to see the footnote. Torah is the Jewish name for the scriptures revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. And they're, the, for example, the first five books of the Old Testament. I knew I'd have to read something to explain that. So, to Moses on Mount Sinai. If mankind were to be able to recognize the Messiah for who he was, when he came, it would have to be prepared by being taught beforehand to expect his coming. Judaism performed this role too. At the time of Jesus, not only was the messianic expectation at the very heart of Judaism, but the Jews lived in eager anticipation of the imminent arrival of the Messiah, in part because it was the time given by the messianic prophecy in the book of Daniel. And 6 says this prophecy is discussed at length in chapter 4, the messianic idea in Judaism. So I must find my place again. Uh, this expectation is evident in Luke 3, verse 15. The people were in expectation, and all men questioned in their hearts concerning John, whether perhaps he were the Christ, even independently of the veracity of the Gospels. This must have been an accurate representation of the messianic expectations of the Jews at the time since they themselves were part of the original intended audience for the Gospels. The authors could not have misrepresented their beliefs without entirely discrediting themselves. The messianic expectation remained the heart of Judaism until the end of the Middle Ages. Next, since God brings his plans into being through the mediation of a man's prayer, and because man's highest purpose is to worship and praise God. God wished there to be a people on earth who would worship and adore the Messiah even before he came and who would fervently pray for his coming, which we should be doing now for the second coming. That's not in the book, that's me. 
this role too was fulfilled by the Jews. Consider, as a single example, the love that permeates David's prophetic depiction of the crucified Christ in Psalm 22, verses 14 to 18. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. Thou dost lay me in the dust of death. Yea, dogs are around about me. A company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my raiment they cast lots. Finally, God would need a people to provide a temporal home for the Messiah when he came and to announce his arrival to the world. This role too was entrusted to the Jews. Thus the roles entrusted to the Jews included, I'm going to, they're numbered, so it's one to nine so far. One, exhibiting a faithfulness and devotion to God that would support a unique intimacy and covenant with him through which the Messiah could eventually come. Number two, in this loyalty and covenant being the primary channel of grace for all of mankind. And there's a footnote number seven. This too is further discussed in chapter four, the messianic idea in Judaism. So we will get a little more of that, but I now have to go to number three. Prophetically, typologically, foreshadowing salvation history in their own history. Number four, providing a people of sufficient spiritual purity, virtue and morality to be able to be the people among whom God became a man. Five, making God's laws known to mankind. I think the Ten Commandments comes to mind a bit, doesn't it? I'm not saying it's here, it's not written. But. Six, preparing the mother of the Redeemer. That's Mary. Seven, praying for the coming of the Messiah. Eight, very important, adoring and worshipping the Messiah before he came. Nine, providing a temporal home for the Messiah and announcing the good news when he came. To the shepherds, wasn't it's not written here, the shepherds and the angels, and you know it was the poor people that he came among from the very beginning. Consider how beautifully some of these are reflected in the Marianne hymn, O Mary of all women, used in the liturgy of the hours for the common of the Blessed Virgin Mary. O Mary of all women, you are the chosen one, who ancient prophets promised would bear God's only Son. All Hebrew generations prepared the way to thee, that in your womb the God-man might come to set man free. O Mary, you embody all God taught to our race, 
For you are first and foremost in fullness of his grace. We praise this wondrous honour that you gave birth to him, who from you took his manhood and saved us from our sin. That is the end of chapter one. Thank you so much for listening, and that isn't too bad a time for 40 minutes 23 or 5. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. I'm sending you his peace in abundance. And I have to tell you, the book has grabbed me. So I don't think you'll have to wait long for me to continue recording. But I will do the mass readings for today before I go back to that. I might even leave the meditations because I really want to know what number chapter two is. So look out for this book or the readings. And I hope you like it, Deborah, Jane and Susan and David. Yeah, David, you've got the right name. God bless you all. Thank you for listening and sharing. God bless.